Hi, Darren here. Uh, in uh, last year's roundup of uh, my favourite music, uh, I highlighted Luke Haynes and Peter Buck and their album, All the Kids Are Super Bummed Out. And you may remember back at the start of July in Recent and Decent, I was talking about uh, the auteurs. In fact, I was talking about this. This is people around here don't like to talk about it. It's a six CD box set of the auteurs, the complete EMI recordings. So in this episode, yeah, a brief talk from me today about, about the auteurs from someone, that's me again, uh, who completely sidestepped them uh, back in the day. Yeah, blame Britpop. I can't have been the only one giving the much of the UK indie pop cover stars, I guess, of the 90s, you know, very short shrift back then. Uh, Britpop to me was, uh, with very few exceptions, pulp maybe, I think, uh, just a plague pit that had to be given a very, very wide berth. And bands like the auteurs were, to me at least, uh, dancing right on the edge of that pit. Uh, and that was all I really needed to know. However, uh, the solo releases from Luke Haynes over the last 10 years or so have uh, got me intrigued enough to pick up this box set. And um, a recent read through Luke's auteurs period memoir, Bad Vibes, Britpop and My Part in Its Downfall, has confirmed to me um, that yes, uh, you know, the Britpop event horizon is now... I think distant enough to safely appreciate the auteurs on their own merits. Yeah, please feel free to look elsewhere for full reviews on all of these albums. I I'm not going that deep. This is just a quick overview and some broad stroke observations. Yeah, you should be seeing the contents of the box itself. It's six CDs. This is a CD only release and it comes with an accompanying booklet uh, with an introduction by Luke. And I'm not going to stick to these uh, qu quite chronologically. Um, being as I'm more familiar with his more recent stuff, I I'll start with the most recent album here, which is uh, 2003's uh, Das Kapital, the songwriting genius of Luke Haynes and the auteurs. Yeah, this is mostly uh, orchestral reworkings of auteurs era songs. There are one or two new compositions on here. And it's basically a, a kind of a parting recording uh, on EMI and kind of an alternative take on the titled, you know, drop a greatest hits compilation as you jump ship. Yeah, and to me, uh, this, this is an interesting release, uh, but not really yeah, essential. Some tracks I think translate better to this format than others. Um, the earlier stuff works best here. These kind of John Barry style arrangements working well on tracks like yeah, How Could I Be Wrong and uh, Starstruck. And interestingly enough, on this disc, I think that's where the bonus material uh, really uh, scores. Uh, it has six tracks from Luke's original four track demos circa about 1991 of the New Wave era songs. And despite all the hiss and the cardboard box percussion, really, uh, they're superbly realised takes of the final recordings, uh, showing just how, you know, worked out this material was before the band uh, was even a thing. So we'll jump from one end to the other. We'll skip to the beginning and uh, 1992's New Wave, uh, their debut album on Hut Recordings. So in, in the blurb, in the booklet, uh, Luke restates, uh, as he does in uh, his book Bad Vibes, how important it is to get your debut right. I'll quote him here. He says, you've had 20 years to write the damn thing. You cannot possibly afford to fuck it up. And he didn't. Uh, th there's really very little to date this stuff. Uh, it's classic kind of doomed romantic. Beds it indie pop touched with, you know, a very bleak, hard hearted streak of cynicism that sets it apart from what would have been recent contemporaries of his at the time, people like Robert Forster, Grant McLennan, uh, Morrissey even. Yeah, Showgirl was the debut single, um, but the standouts for me hearing this for the first time are uh, Bailed Out, uh, How Could I Be Wrong, and Early Years, which all kind of plot a path through the usual jangle reference point without sounding derivative or, or stale. Um, it's a kind of a scuffed 70s patina to a lot of the electric guitars here, which do reflect some of those, you know, early proto Britpop acts like Suede. Um, but the songwriting is very, very strong and sure footed. Uh, surprisingly little cello on this album, too, which would come to be like a big element, you know, a signature element almost of their sound on subsequent recordings. Next up, uh, Now I'm a Cowboy from 1994. And um, yeah, for a difficult second album, I think it stands toe to toe with New Wave. Haynes has long declared it as inferior because of the money and the studio time lavished on it for, as he saw it, uh, very little discernible benefit, which might well be the case. But uh, purely as a listener, uh, that's immaterial. And the songs here, I think, feature some of the band's most enduring numbers. 
Uh, Lenny Valentino, the opener, was their highest placed single. It just missed the top 40. It's two, two and a half minutes of chopping, kind of near pixie style riffing and melody. And it kind of hits a kind of boiling Stooges like hammering repetition. Yeah, you know, think something like I want to be your dog uh, and just it just doesn't hang about. It's a great, great single. Uh, New French Girlfriend is the closest they come to that kind of glammed up suede sound, but it's so relentlessly detached uh, and miserable that it's Haynes to the core. Yet yeah, there's a very, very strong closing run to uh, Now I'm a Cowboy. Uh, the four track sequence from Underground Movies to The Closer, Daughter of a Child, I think having listened to all these albums now, might be my favourite run of auteur songs across uh, the lot of them. Yeah, in fact, spoilering this little hop through the box midway, uh, this this could well be my favourite of the albums here. Yeah, the sound is tougher than the debut. The guitars have got that thick, bronzy kind of Mick Ronson thwack to them. Uh, the cello integrates magically into the songs all over the album. The tone is just right uh, and the track sequencing feels perfect. And for a little context, uh, lest we forget, this album was released a week or two after Blur's Park Life in the spring of 1994. And, you know, given the climate it was released in, the hype, the geezerish bonhomie, the affected mockneyisms, you know, it was peak lad mag. Um, it's probably no wonder Haynes found it difficult to remain objective about No, I'm a Cowboy, uh, despite it being their highest charting UK album, uh, reaching number 27. Yeah, the tour for Now I'm a Cowboy was uh, pretty grueling, taking the band through the USA and Europe uh, with, you know, The Road, exacting a heavy price mentally uh, on Luke, who uh, ultimately did himself a very nasty injury in late 1994, breaking both ankles after a drunken fall. Uh, he was housebound, in pain, confined to a wheelchair, heavily medicated, and he began writing some new material drawing heavily on the darker side of his childhood 1970s. You know, the high-profile murders, the terrorists, the politics, the cults. And he kind of abandoned that class-obsessed, you know, kinks with a bit of cynicism style of the first two albums. And the first, you know, visible fruits of this new songwriting focus was this, 1996's Steve Albini-produced album, After Murder Park. Uh, recorded in the spring of 1995, it was held back from release for a year, uh, only to come out in March 1996. And this was a week or two uh, before the Dunblane School Massacre, which um, made the album, you know, with its songs about child murders, cult suicides, air crashes, a particularly hard sell, which is a shame because it is very good. Um, the live style of recording by Albini really pulls the grit and the muscle of the band who who were kind of tour hardened by this point right to the fore you know the cellos a huge kind of gurgling Hammond organ you know it's got shades of Van de Graaff generator maybe um all the sounds are rendered beautifully and as it is it's kind of a, a definitive a dissenting a defiant maybe yeah, anti-Brit pop statement it's murky it's caustic it's wounded it's doomed sounding yeah, this is more dark life than park life. Yeah, I think Albini did here um, for the auteurs what he did for the wedding present with their Sea Monsters album. He just let the band express the songs without fear and, uh, and capture the dynamics and the weight of their live sound in a studio setting. Uh, tracks, yeah, the Beatlesque twists of uh, unsolved child murder, uh, the mournful lament to uh, the child brides in the song of the same title and the kind of heavy, congested wallop of that massive organ sound in Buddha are all big highlights for me. And Murder Park and Luke's next album, the kind of one-off non-auteurs Baden-Meinhof LP, uh, also included here, are both big signposts, I think, to his future and the way he would increasingly choose to make music. Uh, namely, that is by, by focusing on a single scenario or an idea and then writing uh, around that core idea. Yeah, I hesitate to use the phrase concept album here, as that has all kinds of you know, highfalutin connotations of you know, over-egged visions and prog era pomposity, but that's where he seemed to be heading. Uh, thematically, I think at first with Murder Park and then conceptually uh, with Bader Meinhof, an album about the Red Army faction, that's the Bader Meinhof group, uh, you know, a violently far left uh, terrorist organization operating in West Germany uh, in the 1970s. 
Yet this was recorded sporadically in the year between the recording and the release of uh, the After Murder Park album. And it is a weird album constructed using dubby atmospherics, and tabla, Indian percussion, this squelchy funk bass and swooping eastern sounding strings. And for the half an hour it lasts, it's a blast, you know, an improbable mashup of P-Funk, spy movie soundtrack, Beatlesque vocal melodies all stringing along that queasy lyrical thread about the exploits of an off its rocker extremist terrorist group that all killed themselves en masse, lost in custody one night in October of 1977. Yeah, the title track, uh, Meet Me at the Airport, uh, There's Gonna Be an Accident, uh, Back on the Farm, were all standouts for me. But honestly, at just 31 minutes, uh, take it all in in one sitting and just marvel at it. I think it's worth bearing in mind at this point that when Luke and, and the producer Phil Vinyl first started on the Bader Meinhof project, which I think was in about October of 1995, uh, Blur's Country House single had recently been number one. And then fast forward to a year later when you know, Bader Meinhof was finally released in September of 1996, the Spice Girls wannabe was at number one. Yeah, if you're in any doubt, you know, the serious, very dark, very twisted cut up style of this album was about as much at odds with the pop cultural zeitgeist as it was possible to be. In fact, I think you could argue that it was about nine, nine or so months later that we would finally see a very big UK act, you know, poop the party mood of the preceding few years when uh, Radiohead released OK Computer in June of 1997. And you could make the argument here, I probably will, that the heaviness, you know, the seriousness, you know, the chill of both After Murder Park and to a lesser extent, maybe Bader Meinhof laid some of the groundwork for that album's success and for, you know, subsequent darker releases over the next few years. Pulp's uh, This Is Hardcore would be a good example. Um, yeah, all these things, I think, finally kind of reached critical mass and and hold the good ship Britpop uh, below the waterline. Uh, moving on then to the last studio album build as the auteurs, namely 1999's How I Learned to Love the Boot Boys. Yeah, this album was recorded piecemeal uh, during the same period that Luke and John Moore, ex of the Jesus and Mary Chain, had formed Black Box Recorder with uh, Sarah Nixie which was kind of a more formal attempt to take that twisted, cut up kind of Bader Meinhof concept, you know, fully into the pop realm, you know, this dubby, shiny electronic pop, which was designed to break the charts. And the Boot Boys album definitely overlaps with Black Box Recorder sonically, I think, uh, being the least guitar forward release to bear the auteur's name. Uh, similar to Murder Park, it deals with the England of Luke's youth, you know, the glam pop, the hooligan culture, the last death throes of the post-war consensus in UK politics, uh, UK society. It's all in here, both lyrically and sonically. In the title track, I hear dubby echoes of you know, Pills, Metal Box, maybe even a little of the reggae, heavy punk of the Ruts, Babylon's Burning. Yet some changes uh, channel some very heavy Bowie vibes and the Rubettes uh, even recycles yeah, the Sugar Baby Love chorus of that band's biggest hit. And I think a little of the sad, wounded kind of toughness of the auteurs' first releases are also mirrored here in the lovely uh, 1967 and the kind of the disturbing recollections of school. Yeah, a very clean pop sounding record on the surface, but the dark undercurrents of Murder Park are right there. And the songwriting and the lyricism on display is as uncompromisingly Haynes as ever. Uh, and that is the box uh, covered. Um, one final word, though, for all the extras here. That's the B-sides, uh, single-only releases, EP tracks, alternate takes on each of the discs. Yeah, they are uniformly excellent, I have to say. Uh, nothing in the way of filler to speak of with many tracks. Uh, easily the equal of some of those on the albums themselves. Special mentions for New Waves are She Might Take a Train, which was a free 7-inch single issued around the time of the album release. Um, for Kenneth Anger's Bad Dream from the Back With The Killer EP. And in fact, all the bonus uh, Boot Boy stuff. There's some great studio tracks and some lovely acoustic versions of album cuts on there too. Uh, and that's the auteurs, really. Uh, I've come to them the long way around via Luke's post auteurs solo work, uh, but I've been listening to this a lot since picking it up and I'm 
very glad I finally got over myself enough to revisit these albums. Yeah, I'll warrant that Luke is a difficult character on paper. Yeah, all those bitchy, arrogant outpourings over the years. But if you park that and you just take the music on its own merits, um, yeah, he's a very fine songwriter indeed. If it helps, all the recent interviews I've seen with Luke seem to show a guy who's mellowed considerably, certainly in the need to share his opinions at least. He just shows a picture of someone who's settled into a very satisfying and productive routine. You know, art is work, do the art, get it down, get it out, don't overanalyze and just keep going. And it's a process that very much reminds me of the work ethic of the late Marky Smith, who Luke is a fan of, who also saw no point in just sitting around having arty thoughts when you could just be cracking on and doing the work. And I think uh, I think we can quite legitimately talk about Luke and Mark in the same breath, um, doing neither of them any kind of grand injustice. OK, uh, thanks for watching if you've got this far. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, and if you have any opinions on Luke Haynes, the auteurs, these albums, um, then yeah, uh, please feel free to comment down below. Yeah, as ever, likes and subscriptions are our most welcome and really help the channel. But yeah, in the meantime, uh, you take care and bye for now.